Well, good evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Roy Bates. I'm a trustee for the Woodstock History Center. And this, they gave me this job tonight, maybe because I'm an old time native like Dale is, but here I am. I'm going to be for a couple of minutes. Uh, Dale will be discussing the Woodstock in Stables. Most of you who are here today are probably already acquainted with Dave. He was a longtime saw salesman, he and his dad and his mom on South Street and International for many years. His dad retired from there, and I guess you did too, right? Uh, and Dale would be known as a stable rat rather than a rug rat. He spent most of his young years at the stable, either working or playing there. When we were kids, and Jane will know too, we, we ran all over town. Nobody paid any attention to us. We went where we wanted to, Mount Peg, Balefield, and everywhere else. Dale was probably in the third grade, I think, when I graduated from high school. So when I knew him, we knew all the kids, we knew everybody. Daniel has done extensive research on the Inn Stables and Ferguson Stables that they were, were allowed, alluded to. Uh, in the back of the room, you will see a camera taking this for Woodstock Public Television, which is good, and they do a lot of good work uh, recording what's going on and recording our seminars without any charge, and we really appreciate it. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Lastly, I guess I'd like to thank uh, everybody for attending and uh, joining us here at the Senior Center. I hope you enjoy the evening program, which promises to be extremely interesting. <laughs> I would like now to introduce Dale and uh, please give him a round of applause. Thank you. Um, I started at the stable somewhere around when I was 11 years old. I, I, <laughs> I lived around the corner. And uh, I happened in and just happened to stay. Ruth called up my mother after a little while and said, hey, your brat's over here. That's <laughs> Ruth. Your brat's over here. And mother said, well, kick him out and send him home. He said, he said no, 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 I'm going to put him to work. <laughs> and I worked for Ruth long after the stables closed. I was an adult. I had children. And I did work for her on and off at her place on the South Road. She was, she was the person who was at best, not at best, poor word, um, she aimed me and other young people on the path to success. Because you did not have but one path, it was hers. <laughs> I like to tell people that when I got to boot camp in the Army, there wasn't a sergeant available could scare me because I just had four years of boot camp. <laughs> and, but all kidding aside, she, was, she did a lot for a lot of young people. And these are the rug rat, uh, the bar stable rats. And this young lady right here is sitting right here. Aww. This is Jan Lord. Goodness. That's me. That was a cute little, that was a cute little cuss, wasn't I? What year was this? Somewhere around 59 or 60. <laughs> That's Gary Woods, and anybody that was around Woodstock at any length of time knew him as he ran the Woodstock Sudoku for years. Yeah. Gary and I, we went into the coachless, horseless coaching business, automobiles. Oh. <laughs> this lady here is Kathy White Newcomb, who now lives in Virginia. She raised, raises or raised Morgan horses. Uh, she was, last I knew, was keeping the bloodlines of Mrs. Bryant on the south in South Woodstock, keeping her bloodlines going as best she could. Um, she was, 
named the Morgan Horse Lady of the Year about five years ago. And Jan, uh, she has three, mar three horses. She rode the 100 mile and won the lightweight division in something. She uh, managed Green Mountain Horse Association for a few years back in the 90s. And we've always known where everybody was. I know where she, I don't know where she, where she lives, I know the town she lives in. <laughs> These two ladies were, we, I refer to as permanent party, they were hired full-time help uh, at the stables. And this was Ann Hutchins, uh, Lordy, Hutchins Harper. She was not a rat. She was, she was lent to us by her grandmother for the 100 miles. This was during 100 mile time. And um, she later went on to raise Belgium horses in South Woodstock and Cornwall. And she imported the real, which she would refer to as the real Belgium horses. Uh, they were not the gold ones that we see, but the American Belgians, these were the Romes that came in from France. She imported them and sold them. Did a very spectacular job. Chatted with her briefly a couple of years ago when I started all this, and she said the same thing about Ruth. She said, I never was there a lot, but she made an indentation of it. <laughs> now, what's, I need to move along. Um, Woodstock Inn was built, opened, 1892. At that time, this was the stables, which was built for the inn. Previously that, they did not have an inn that needed a stable of this nature. This one uh, in, well, why did they have such large stables? In, uh, let's see here, in uh, 1910, there were 1,705 horses in Woodstock. There was, in Vermont total, there was 80,556. In just Vermont Farms, there was 28,147 that year. So that was big industry. Enough so that I have, to, at some point in that era, there was 26 blacksmiths listed in the town of Woodstock. <laughs> at that time, majority of blacksmiths did horseshoeing. It wasn't until later that I heard the word farrier. And uh, so now they're very much blacksmiths and farriers. And most of the people we know are, well, most people I know are farriers. But that was a, a barn, this, this was all wide open. And this is Court Street, dirt. And this was three stories, carriages in the bottom. The second floor was where they kept robes. They had buffalo robes, uh, bear skin robes, anything, because when they went out in the wintertime, they needed one. And the top shelf, top shelf, top row is where the people stayed that worked, worked there. Um, another interesting thing, Woodstock's population in 1859 was 3,041. In 2010, it was 3,048. <laughs> We've come a long ways. <laughs> Moving on up. Um, one other thing that, which has nothing to do with this whatsoever, but there was a, uh, in research, I, I ran across a, a Ross Brothers down in Texas that were a large livery stable. And between 1907 and 1947, they averaged 275 horses and mules a day selling for a total of four million in 40 years. The vast majority went to the government. The Calvary, a lot of them, a lot of that was in the First World War. There was a, a letter in the, um, I presume the standard, the predecessor to the standard, in July 7th, 1892, that F.E. Richmond, now we know F.A. Richmond is the Ford dealer. Nobody can tell me who F.E. was. Uh, he has a new stable, very large and well-appointed. His equipment is constantly growing. This was, he'd, he'd taken this over when it was built. The inn never ran the stables. The, rent, the inn leased their stables. Somebody else ran it. The inn never was responsible for running the stables. This past week, new inventory, six two-seat Surreys, three one-seat Surrey, six fine Phaetons, which were really nice carriages, one Essex Trap, and an imposing vehicle called an English Brake, 
with seats on top for 13 passengers. All had arrived. Now remember, this all came by rail. Everything came into Woodstock, came in by the railroad train. Oh, and the, the brake was, was uh, he had specials, stylish six-in-hand grays. November 4th, 1904, Alan N. Townsend was operating the stables. Six o'clock in the morning, they discovered a fire. Started in the harness room, probably from an oil heater, they, they thought. I've since read an article where they were trying to possibly, they had just put some electric lights in, whether that had anything or no. You know, everybody was grabbing straws. There were 33 horses in the barn at the time. Three were boarders. 25 of the horses stood in straight stalls along the west wall, would be facing that way. And they got them all out. Luckily, it was when everybody was coming to work. They had people that lived there, which had come down, feeding, and the people who lived on the outside were coming in to take care of them. They had a large staff with that many horses. They got every horse in, they took them out one at a time, passed them to neighbors, you know. One broke loose and ran back into the barn. Well, the firefighters went back in and booted him back out the door. <laughs> but in the process, there were 69 sets of harnesses at the beginning of the fire, and they only saved two. They lost 26 slaves and 54 other wheeled vehicles. Over $1,000 in robes. Loss, estimated losses to the Woodstock Hotel Company, which was the building, uh, was $8,000. In 2015, what about $187,000? 2,000 of it was insured. Uh, Mr. Townsend estimated his losses at 7,000 or 164000 in today's money. It was announced in the paper on the following Monday that Mr. Townsend had purchased the livery business of L.H. Whit Whitcomb and moved in started a new business. Well, there was originally, just out of sight here, there was a livery stable, and behind here there was a livery stable, a rather large one. The one or the other he moved into. And you, there are pictures of livery stable sign at uh, off of the green down the driveway used to go to Mrs. Norman Williams and one went through one of the alleys over here well over here actually so they uh, and at that time Woodstock did not have fire trucks they had hose reels just hose rolled up on wheels and they cranked them and they hooked them up to hydrants and they, they took the pressure that was available and knocked it down, or they didn't knock it down, they just, whatever they did. But they managed to save the two buildings. This building and this building were saved. And keep that in mind, I'm coming back to those two buildings. <laughs> immediately, and I do mean immediately, oops, did you want to see something? Immediately, there was, there was clearing away, and it was noted that they were, they were designing and building a new stables. Eleven months later, they opened it. Now, this stable was 193 and a half feet long, 65 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. Now, to envision this, if the Jolly Green Giant grabbed that stable, <laughs> set it in Queechee Gorge on its end, 30 feet above the bridge. <clears throat> and then wonder why when we were kids we had no extra weight running around on that up and down that barn. We were we were on a dead we never walked. We didn't know what jogging was, we were running. <laughs> but you compare this to what we had before, that's a barn. That's a stable. When that came out it was noted in numerous publications as the finest in the New England, if not the East Coast. Architect Concord, New Hampshire. All right, I was at a standstill for a number of months. How did they get somebody from Concord, New Hampshire, up here to do a, a stable? You know, house maybe, Millen's Mansion maybe, stables. Contacted the Concord, New Hampshire Historic Society, the architects of New Hampshire, 
all they could tell me, they could give me a, a rundown on, on Mr. Randette. And, uh, but no idea. Stumbling, looking for something else one day, I discovered when that, when the old barn burnt, he was across the street finishing up the new high school, which has long since been gone. The house guy that we knew. He was architect over there for that. He just moved across the street. <laughs> but you do know that he moved with a lot of ideas. He must have been watching that, that inn being built. Because look at all the int intricate design features he has on this stable. Little eyebrow windows. Now, I, this, the barn was split right down the middle. Originally, there were 60 stalls in this end for straight stalls. And this end was wide open. This big door here, you could drive in, and there was no support from the floor to the second floor. It was wide open. Here's a man who... You know, um, designed it through all trusses. You could swing a support, that's according to my article somewhere, you could swing a stagecoach in, swing the horses around, pull over to the far end, which would have been over in here, unharness the horses, the coach would get put away, the horses and harnesses would go directly into the horse barn, horse section. The second floor, and there was, oh yeah, there was an elevator, which I'll show you a little later. There's an eight foot by eight, Eight foot by eighteen foot elevator that put all the carriages on the second floor, and I we spent a fair amount of time on the second floor, and when we were there, there was a lot of carriages, carts, carriages, sleighs that had been restored, most of them, and they were up there covered over with 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 uh, uh, sheets, kind of looked like Halloween, and at least once a year we had to take them all down, take them out, wash them, sham them, and they went back up on the elevator, but we never turned the lights on. Because all these side windows gave all the lights in the world into that loft. The wall went down through about here, and this was all hay mail. Same thing. Never turned the light on. I don't ever remember turning the light on. Mr. Randette had been a drummer boy for four years in the Civil War. In some major battles. He'd been the keeper of the New Hampshire State House for four years, a janitor before becoming a partner in a farm in Concord. Fourteen years later, he's hired to do the staples. Staples. He worked as a carpenter, mail carrier, and in general business in Concord in the meantime. He got this all finished. It was opened in 19, November 1905. In 1909, he fell from his steam motor launch in Winnipesaukee and drowned. Now this guy was placed here for a reason. <laughs> in my estimation. And my brother and I, who's my brother sitting over here, he, uh, we got to discussing him falling out of the boat. And he said, well, of course he fell out of the boat and drowned. He says, he came from New England. We don't ever learn to swim. <laughs> Wasn't too far wrong. Um, he did not build a stable or a barn before, and he never built one afterwards, for what anybody can tell me. He did it right. That's absolutely. But a lot of, of little intricate things which we'll get to. Uh, there was there was robe storage and robe drying rooms here. Because when they came in, in the wintertime they needed to be dried or they were gonna get moldy. And and I, I read an article where sometimes they'd receive a word up from White River that a train had come in that somebody needed to come to Woodstock in. They they would leave with a pair of horses on a sleigh and they would head to White River in the dead of winter. And they had to be timed just right, because you met somebody coming at you, there was not a double road. There was somebody had to pull out. They'd go down, they'd get the people on, get the luggage on, cover them in robes, and get them back to the inn as fast as they could. That's back in the old days. So it was 130, uh, you know, 13,000 square feet. Originally it took, when it was rebuilt, 40 straight stalls, and 19 box dolls. In Dale, what's the difference? Well, most generally workhorses and carriage horses simply had a stall they stood in. And they were hooked in the front. Okay, a box stall is double that size and they're loose. Loose box. What you see today, really hard to find straight stalls today. Everybody think, oh my God, you're through it. <laughs> but it always was anything that worked in harness had a straight stall. 
wasn't many years later that I discovered that, not necessarily true, but um, this was, this is in there, this little thing over here, when this was built, that was to store motor cars under. There was no other place to, over here, this little thing. The same year this was built, the first car showed up in Woodstock, 1905. But when we were there, there was no, that was not there, and there was no sign of it ever being there. So I don't know how long that lived. It wasn't too long before, just beyond there, the Woodstock garage was built, which took over all the, all the car business for the inn or Woodstock, for that matter. And my dad went to work there in 1929. My great-grandfather was a foreman on this job, building it, George Marcel. Grandfather and father both worked in here in the 20s. I came along in the late 50s, and so I like to say that my great-grandfather built it, opened the doors, I was there to close it. <laughs> Not that I wanted to, I've always been upset that I was, I was involved with that. Um, but look at, look at the design compared to the other one. And of course, this is, this is a tennis court. Mostly for the inn, and not much to do with stables. Now that's one of the prime pictures that you see all over, been well used around the area. Um, this is the north end. This is where the coaches and whatnot. But look at the pillars. How many stables you see with pillars? <laughs> but they match the pillars that are around the other side of the inn. The roof design matched the inn. The, well, yeah. The inn. <laughs> I don't know what the monstrosity is today, but it ain't the inn. <laughs> I will say, um, if any of you folks know Eddie English, some of you through school, okay. Eddie used to like to say that when the old inn was torn down and, and the new inn was built, only two things moved him and the eagle. <laughs> and, but here, these rooms up here were for the. For the um, Originally, if, when the stables was open, were there 24 or 7 help? Um, there was somebody always in the stables, and especially after the, the other one burned, they were very conscious about fires. But I went on a tangent of the stagecoach. There are a lot of pictures of the stagecoach. Probably got carried away here. But there's the stagecoach delivering the mail from the train to the post office, which is across the street. Well, it's across the street, part of where the bank was. And then, right, there's the stairs, more like a ladder. And then there's this picture, same, same stagecoach. And there's the Hupmobile, 1915 Hupmobile showed up. Of course, then the stagecoach took the sideline. But as a kid growing up, and I don't know why, slang terminology for a car you didn't know what it was was a hupmobile. I did not realize there was a hupmobile for years. Hup, H-U-P, hupmobile. At least that's what is listed in one of the history books at Woodstock. Now, there's the stagecoach, the last time it was hitched. Um, what do you do? Getting sorry, I have trouble with names. The guy over here gave me the pictures. Um, these are his, his horses, and then what they did, they were they they had a documentary of some sort going on. This was at the Coolidge Museum. Um, Hickey, Bruce Hickey, he gave them to me. There it was a week ago yesterday. Still at the museum. Probably never to see horses again. Good shape. I shook the wheels and whatnot. But I don't think I want to ride to Boston in it, but it's still there in all its glory, right by the door. This was an interesting picture. Look at the corn. How could they get corn next to the inn? Then it dawned on me. Dawned on me. After a while, the brook's over here. That's the foot of High Street. I took this because you could see the the lip on the end. This is where the hay went in. The, the doors are closed here. But cupolos. Anybody that was here last winter for a 
discussion on, on attached barns in Maine, there, there was a uh, discussion over cupolas and ventilators. And the gentleman who was given the, 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 the presentation told us that these were ventilators, not cupolas. Well, I got to do this way, they're cupolas. <laughs> they did vent. This was a highly ventilated stable because there was vents all the way down through into the basement, then up through into the horse barn, and eventually on through the hayloft and outdoors. It was highly ventilated. For, uh, Were they fans? No, just so. Uh, gravity feed. Because under this little lip here, there was a drive that went down, and it's where all the manure went. The, the young people, when your first job at the stables was scuttle hole. <laughs> door you picked up and all the manure gets scuttled down it. That was your job. You were to shovel it, stand there with that wheelbarrow load, shovel it, and you moved on up to other jobs. But I was a scuttle all forever. And sometimes you had to go <coughs> under the building. Oh, right? yes. Right? And <laughs> knock off the top of that pile. Piles. <laughs> or we'd have to go around to the second aisle. Yeah. Now, these, this barn had a double aisle with stalls on both sides, which I'll get to a picture here in a minute. These are the people who, who were the, worked as a contractor, or worked for the contractor. George Marcel, my great-grandfather, he built a lot of barns in the area and houses. I think this was too big a job for him to tackle on his own, so he became foreman. I was discussing the stables with a friend of mine, Toppy Gould, if anybody knows him. We were sitting at a hunting camp off up in the mountains of Killington, and I mentioned something about the stables. And he said, you know the strangest thing? I said, what? He says, I grew up on Maple Street. My dad was at the, what later became Vermont, Vermont National Bank, without a creature savings bank, the bank with the pillars, yeah. People's Bank today. My dad was there, so I'd walk downtown sometimes. But he says, for some reason, any time I walked by that stables, if there was a door open, I walked through it. He said, I would just hear the horses. I would look at the horses. I never touched them. He said, I was not a horse person. I had no interest in horses. I had to walk through the stables. And so... You, Jan sent me this list. That's his grandfather, Charles Gould. He was the mason on the job. Not the mason, I'm sorry, stonework. He did all the stone foundation. I, I called him up and said, hi, I know what's wrong. I know why you're, <laughs> why you had to go through that stables. <laughs> this was, getting good pictures of the stables is very hard. Getting good inside pictures is near impossible. Um, this right here is one of the two doors that lined up perfectly with the two rows of stalls. There was this one and the one on the other side. Horses were in and out of here regularly. We had one, one narrow passageway on the back side that went out to the ring, rings, paddocks, whatever, and we had the big, big door at the other end. One of the things I mentioned, the elevator, and I couldn't find an elevator, picture of an elevator that had a carriage on it, but this is, this is the company that made the elevator out of Boston. And this here was a rope. We could move that as kids. We could put a carriage on that and put two, three rugrats and stand on it, and somebody would be up, pull that to the second floor. It was effortless. It was effortless, effortless. And this was, there's a counter counterweight here, the one we had a double counterweight, yeah. double counter, and it was listed at two tons, wow. which had a reason. At the, when you got up to this level, uh, this was the second floor, it would go another six feet or so, and on the far end were grain bins, and they would load the grain into 100 gallon, pound, 100 pound bags, lift it up, flip up the lid and pour the grains into three different bins. And then down in the horse section, there was a door you slid open, which we never used, but we knew it was there. Unless we were hiding from somebody, and then we were sliding there. And down on the horse section, there'd be three of these things, where the grain would come down through and you could mix them. What the three grains were, I'm not sure. I don't know if they had crimped oats back then, but they certainly had oats and they had bran. And I don't know if they had sweet feed there or not. We did in later years. But there were three of these in there. This was a first class stable. Twisted hook. 
um, because of the fire, they were very conscious about another fire. The carriage end on the west side, the walls were held up by hooks. You could walk in with a hammer, slam the hooks up, push real hard, and the walls went out. So they could get their carriages out. They weren't necessarily worried about the horses, but they're getting their carriages out. <laughs> but and it wasn't until the last year the stable was open I saw one of these. And I aha. I had heard about them. And I don't know I may have been from Ruth, I don't remember. This obviously is not the stables, but I uh, as I say, pictures of the stables are hard to come by. This it was all loose hay. Uh, it wasn't until the late fifties that baled hay went in. But this you can you know they came in and I don't know where they came, but with that many horses they certainly bought a lot of hay. Um, so it was brought in and this was a hook system which I'll show you. That's how it functioned. This here would come down, great big gob, and somebody was over here with a horse, or in our case a jeep. <laughs> somebody, one, of, one of the kids drove the jeep and the other one sat on the hood and held the rope. And would back up. When it backed up, this went up. And then it, you could hear it latch. And then it would pull it in, and somebody in the barn would holler here, or there, now, something. And there'd be another rope that would get pulled and would open up and drop the hay. Mm -hmm. Difference being, stables had the had the ventilation such that it had to it had to go down two sides. So right here, they had a switch, just like an old railroad switch. So somebody could pull a pull a rope and it can send it down the right hand side, can pull it down the left hand side. You don't see them every day. Mm -hmm. I did run across one that was sitting on the floor of a museum in Minnesota recently. Think I could find a picture? No! <laughs> of course, we only took 6,000 pictures when we were on the road. But anyways, that's, that's and then back to the cupola versus ventilator. That's a ventilator. They're sold as ventilators even. The hay all came down um, into bins. Now this was, these were all, all the stable wear was purchased in Boston from a company called Snow. All the flooring, the stalls, the doors were all done by hard rock maple. This was not a cheap wow. job. Everything was sent in by rail. All the iron work like this. Now this had a solid wood built around it, tongue and groove, so that the hay, when you lifted the lid in the upstairs, you threw the hay in and it went, went there. Today you're going to find people, horse people, have all sorts of things to say about, oh, you can't feed horses like that because it gets in their eyes and it gets up their nose. Well, it didn't get in our horse's eyes or up their noses. <laughs> we either had brighter ones than today or I don't know what. But uh, they were, I mean, these were heavy duty. Um, and I have a catalog that has all this stuff in it. All the stalls, all the different ones, and the variant sizes. I mean, there's probably seven different sizes of these things you could get. Um, every stall had a cast iron grain bin. No buckets, no such things. This one was for horses that would pull around and push their grain out on the floor. Ruth took, did not take nicely to horses that threw grain out or wasted feed. If if you had one of these, we were putting one of these in, or they moved stalls. And this one it was they would, would take twice as long to eat because they were licking and carrying on in there. And this one had a big lip here. Um, I always like these better. They just look richer. Can I tell a story? Sure. <laughs> so when I was like 11 years old, my favorite horse at the stable was um, had a bone disease, and he had to go to the auction in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, which. It's not a good ending for a horse. And for an 11 year old, it was like, oh my God. Oh, and, right? and so I left my house. I lived a block away from the stable growing up. And I left my house in the middle of the night to go down to spend the night with Bo, who I knew was leaving at 5.30 in the morning. And so I sat in one of those. In <laughs> my mother is not a horse person. 
I am bawling. I am unconsolably bawling about this poor horse. And I don't know, I was probably a couple hours, and all of a sudden I hear, Janet, <laughs> it's my mother. <laughs> she found that I was missing, somehow knew I was at the stable, and came and took me back home. But I spent a few hours sitting in that room. <laughs> This, um, anytime carriages, slaves, or whatever went out and came in, they were washed and cleaned. Um, primarily to make them look nice. It was a livery stable, so the turnout always had to be fresh harness, fresh horse, fresh carriage. Everything had to be first class. So they had this washroom, which later became Fergie's workshop. And if you look up here and you go to a car wash today, you'll find the same mechanism in the ceiling. <laughs> And it, it was the only place that had heat or water. And I was told one time they did not use hot water because it ruined the paint. But you see the wash tub here. And, 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 and everything was shamed. Everything was shamed. Now this is the drawing that I did. In 74, I think I did this. From memory. <laughs> Couldn't do it today, but memory. I didn't have the dimensions of the stables at the time, um, but this is what, after the straight stalls left, this was the 36 box stalls. This was the side we used most of the time. These were the borders. We had a lot of borders, uh, which was the prime business. And um, end stalls here, These, this stall and this stall was we call stud stalls. They, you, they're like closing the door in a vault. Boom! I mean, those doors had to be that thick. Um, we never had studs. And I don't know why a livery stable would have had studs, but they, they had these heavy, super heavy-duty stalls. These old stalls over here were used for rental horses and used a lot when, our, when the horses came in from Iowa in the spring. They would go over here because half of them were sick. Um, elevator was here. These are the grain bins. This was the workshop. In our day, it was a workshop. It used to be the washroom. I showed you just before. This was a tack room. And you knew you had stepped up to, up to the higher level when you got invited in the tack room. You could work the scuttle hole, but it didn't mean you got the tack room. Uh, and every saddle and every bridle got cleaned every, every day. day. Oh, they got used every day. They got used they every got day. Cleaned. Eventually, we got, eventually got invited in and you had two hours, two to four, with a stop at three for haying, to clean everything that had gone out, whether it was harness, was, was, was uh, not a lot of harnesses went out in our day, some um, saddles, bridles, anything that was used had to get cleaned and, and inspected. But this was where the, this is where the carriages would come in and get unhooked and one thing or another. This funny looking drawing here, you'll see it a little bit later broom closet and stuff here. Now this was all sawdust. Fresh sawdust. They couldn't have been more than 10 days old or we would rake it into the stalls and used it for bedding. That was, oh my god, if that was raked once it was raked a dozen times a day. Horse went down it, you were behind it with a rake. Ruth wanted this, when somebody stepped into that stable she wanted it a show place. Nothing out of, out of place. Not a brush, not a blanket, not a rope. As a matter of fact, we were never given ropes. All the years of handling horses for Ruth, we never had a rope and we never had a chain. We did it strictly by halter. One of my stories, uh, one of the first horses they let me lead, after Billy, which was a little brat here, there was this enormous 16-hand thoroughbred down here in the, in the end, Woody. Woody belonged to Newland Wiles. New, Woody was a nice old gentleman. But each end, that was a water tub, and this was a water tub. And the horses did not have water in the stalls. They were watered twice a day. When we cleaned the stalls, because we cleaned the stalls twice a day. They also were immaculate. Um, whatever reason, Woody could not go from there to there. He had to come here. <laughs> so one of the girls said, Dale, take Woody up. A little cuss. Dale, take Woody up. Over the door, he stuck his head down, grabbed his halter. 
we're going along and we got right smack and they were they were cleaning stalls in here somewhere so one of the girls said hey Woody so he perked his head up boy here I am hanging on that halter feet not hitting the ground and not daring let go you never let go you could be going down Main Street holding on that halter you did not let go <laughs> you were going where it was going and uh, so and all of a sudden you could see in his eye go oh crap Put his, put his head back down, my feet hit the ground, I'm along. <laughs> Obviously, I never forgot that. Uncle was there. Uncle, way down in this corner. Yeah. I don't know how many years he was there. I don't know, long time. Long, long time. Long time. Someone, somewhere, someone has a picture of all the barn rat, all the stable rats, and a couple other people on Uncle out in one of the paddocks. Ruth showed it to me one time, and then I never got a copy of it. But, but I mean, we had his whole back covered, and he just kind of stood there going, "Oh crap!" You know, it's, this this little alleyway right here we we would use to go out to the ring, which we had rings and paddocks out here for turnout. <coughs> Sawdust pile was here, and Ruth and Fergie lived here. In the forties, um, um, they took all their meals from my grandmother down at Benson Place according to my mother. Now, in 1936-37, Owen Moon, a boy farm, and Frank Kennedy of Willie's Overland owned the Woodstock Inn. They made the determination, times have changed, we were going to remodel the, the barn. Straight stalls out, box stalls in. And 1939, Oliver F. Ferguson, Fergie to us, Arrived on the scene from Braintree, Mass. Brought in by Mr. Moon. Mr. Moon had just brought in some five gated horses and he needed a rider. And for he was top flight Madison Square Garden level rider for, for um, gated horses. He was there a year and 1940 he came here. Mr. Moon moved him on up, uptown. And he was there for 20 years. Shortly, I don't know exactly when, shortly after their that's Fergie. Yeah. One of the nicer, one of the nicer pictures, but but staged because leaning on a western saddle, we only had one western saddle in the place, and it belonged to Harold Pierce. <laughs> but he was he was a nice nice gentleman, which we didn't have a lot to do with. We mostly de dealt with Ruth. I had probably more to do with Fergie than some others because if she he wanted to go somewhere with a truck, they sent me you know, right along with Fergie. Go with Fergie. You know. So I went brain tree mass a few times. And, and uh, but that was in this in this tax shop. Here's Fergie moved on up. And this Ruth is not Ruth Shirtless Ferguson. No, wait a minute, backed up. This is not Ruth Sherbin Ferguson. This is a Ruth from Scarsdale, New York, which I never knew anything about. And it says England and Western equipment for all types. So that was definitely before the Ruth we knew got there because she did not have much good to say about Western. Nor, nor forward seat. We all had to learn saddle seat. And we did, which is not bad training, mind you. And there's Ruth. There again, she did not pose well for pictures. She looks good. She's a good looking lady. I mean, very definitely a good looking lady. I don't know who this was. It was just a, a picture that I picked up standing in front of the barn with a, somebody with a Dalmatian. Why did they have Dalmatians? Um, had a Dalmatian. Why did, why did stables and livery people and coaches always have Dalmatians? Run behind the carriage. Run right under the rear axle. <laughs> and when they pulled up, if there was a dog on the street or something, its job was to get rid of it so that the lady could step down. Oh, my goodness. And why was it black and white? Because it's got some grease on it nobody noticed. <laughs> That's what the book out of England said. <laughs> there. That's, that just arrived from Iowa. And there's Fergie wind, winding, up his, winding up his horses. Um, every spring, and I don't, February, March, sometime, they would go to Iowa and buy horses. They had a dealer out there who lined up horses for them to see. Supposedly, Ruth rode them all. Some of the ones we got in there was a little hard to ride. Jan ended up riding most of them. Um, usually, I don't know what, 15, 18, whatever would fit in the trailer. Well, the 
Two trailers. Well, one year, two trailers came in. And one year, a trailer came in and had nothing but donkeys on it. Oh, those were horrible. No, they were. Oh, they were horrible. You couldn't write, you couldn't do nothing but feed them. And Ruth, till the end, had donkeys and she called them her little people. And that's what, anybody that knew the stables of our age, that's what we knew. Ferguson Stables. That's what it was for 20 years. I didn't know it was the inn stables until after Fergie left. I had a very narrow education. One of the few inside pictures I have, getting pictures of the stables inside especially was almost impossible. In our day, we didn't have cameras as kids, we didn't have film, and we certainly couldn't afford the processing. Had to be a boarder. We would not have caught dead having a rope, and we'd not had it tied to something. That, that, I mean, that would have got you fired, crucified, sent home, probably dragged behind the truck. But you see these stalls. These are immaculate stalls. And all heavy duty, super heavy duty. Look at the height of the ceiling. The only barn I was ever in with horses that a horse could rear up and not hit his head. <coughs> And it was always cool in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And warm in the winter. See the ventilator shaft? One of the ventilators went up. Yeah. Starting the basin, going through. And those those um, um, cupolas had ladders up them. And Gary and I used to go up and sit on the roof. Last place in the world Ruth would look for you. <laughs> Until my dad noticed us one day. <laughs> what are you doing on the roof? How do you know it was me? I can't see your ears. <laughs> Gary's idea. <laughs> but I don't know who the horse is, but it's, see the sawdust? Um, now, the other thing that came to mind the other day, um, any barn, you're going to get cobwebs eventually. <laughs> Twice a year, we had to remove cobwebs. And we removed cobwebs with a broom that was taped onto a piece of bamboo. It was about 15 feet long, and you'd go down back and forth, back and forth. And of course, where's it all coming? Oh, you'd itch and scratch for a week. You'd want to jump in the water tub. But... And you couldn't be afraid of spiders. No, or mice. Although I don't think any self-respecting mouse would have turned up in the stables. Ruth had had him for dinner. Uh, you see how few lights we had? But you see the two rows, and right on the other side was two more rows. Fergie was always known for a nice pair of horses. In our day, he did not have them. But um, not too long before was his, was his last hitch. I had a, read an article that he had done. It may have been this one, uh, talking about the stables. And he said he, he, it always was a calling card for a first-class livery stable to have a nice pair of dark horses. I can remember them having a pair of hackneys okay. and, and being in a wagon over on Bale Field and he offered me the reins. Oh my God. I was scared to death and I have, from that moment forward, I never wanted to drive a horse. They were so powerful. Oh, yeah, it it was just, yeah. just amazing. Of course, I later grew up with, with harness horses. My, our family had, had race horses, harness race horses. So I, I was, anytime I, there's Diane right there, her dad had them. Anytime, anytime there was help needed at the racetrack, Dale went to the racetrack. Down to Hinsdale. Down to Hinsdale. <laughs> yes, down to Hinsdale. We'd all load up in a bunch of cars and Woodstock, we'd clean Woodstock right out. Her dad was going to race. Down to Hinsdale we'd go. And said, say, Jim's going to win tonight. So we all loaded up and went down. <laughs> Once in a while he did. <laughs> it, was his, it, was, it was his turn. <laughs> I used to on There's another picture of Fergie. I don't know how I managed to get two in there, but I, that's just a really nice picture. That's a true picture of Fergie in our day. There's the tack shop, oh my tack room. I was sputtering and carrying on, didn't have a picture of the tack room. And Joan Hudson, who was, who was Bob Hudson's sister, um, who was 
No, I don't. I, I back up. I don't know what relative she was, but she was a relative of Fergie's, and she had been at the stables during the Second World War. Fergie brought in a bunch of family people. When the men went off to war, he brought in them wives and kids, and he had them in trailers out behind there. And they worked for him, and he kept them going for the winter, for the until the war was over. Joan Hudson was one of them, and um, uh, this that she had this in this picture, and as Jen said, there. But in our day, there were three rows of saddles, of bridles. <laughs> in the tack trunks. Now up overhead is what I really wanted a picture of. Ruth bought and sold anything to do with harnesses, saddles, anything. Leather work. And the ceiling was gobs. And it all came from Miller's, who was top flight leather. And she, would, she had this stick. Somebody would come in and want a halter. Want a cob size halter. Not terribly expensive. And Ruth would get her stick. She knew where everything was. The sizes, the money. Of course, I think the money varied a little bit on who, who came through the door. <laughs> but you looked up, and until she left, I never knew there was beans up there. Oh, okay. it, was, it was loaded when I got there, and it was yeah. always, full. always, always, always full. <coughs> and that, <laughs> the one thing on the, on, the, on the tack room, there was a door at the end, and it was on a spring. And a plate had a plate glass in it, and there was a bar, a big white bar on it. And because we always had saddles and bridles and stuff, and pads, and we were always buttoning it with our, our shoulders. In coming in, and if we were out somewhere in the in the in the aisles, not doing anything, which we knew better than not to, but she would, we could hear that door bang, and we could tell by the rattle of that glass her mood. <laughs> Certain times that would rattle and we would be gone. Gary and I were real good at going right over the stalls, right up through the hay hatches, right into the hay mound, and be very busy moving hay around. The girls would disappear. The girls could get away with stuff. Gary and I are so, But if, if two people were anywhere near each other, you better be cleaning something. She loved to tell the story of a car pulled up in front of the inn, in uh, front of the stable. These people get out, well dressed people. Got out, came in. Of course, I guess she gave me the evil eye out the window and said, What are they going? Certainly not horse people. She came out to the side door. Can I help you? The lady says, Yes. We under, we're from Hanover. We're from Dartmouth College. We understand this barn is clean enough to eat off the floor. <laughs> you said you can if you want, but I'm not. <laughs> but it was. That floor was swept. Literally, if we, we didn't have something to do, we were cleaning, we were sweeping, we were raking. We were cleaning a horse. We, each one of us had horses in the morning we had to do. We had to have them done by 9 o'clock because at 9.10 or 9.15 we were open for business and the horses were going out to lessons and horses were going out on trail rides. People were coming in to look at horses. And we all, Jan always rode all the horses. You come in and here's this young lady, 90 pounds maybe. Remember not then. One of those guys would pitch her up on top of the horse and she could ride anything. That sold them. That sold them. Now here in the, the um, I don't know how I'm doing, not well. Uh, this is, these are all temporary stalls put in by the Green Mountain for the 100 mile. Uh, one year they had 77 horses in the barn. One of the last years. And the, these were all taken down afterwards, one up the week before and down the week after. The, the barn really stood out during 100 mile time. Mm -hmm. The town turned out for 100 miles. It was, it was a major, major event. Uh, Fergie's dog, uh, Hoppy probably, at that period of time. Riders going out, people watching. <laughs> Street. Coming back, no, this probably, considering there's no saddle on there, that was probably check-in day. Denny Emerson, anybody know Denny? Yeah. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> yeah, we have to have trouble keeping the girls out of Denny's corner. Back in the, there was there was two stalls in the far corner, temporary stalls, that you couldn't get to one without going through the other. So he and his brother always got assigned that. 
one would have the inside stall, the other would have the outside stall. So he had to take one out to get the other one out. They didn't figure they were going to give it to anybody else, so the brothers were there. So, uh, and Denny's, yeah, actually Denny is the one that coughed up the stable rat picture too. How he got it, I don't know. Yeah, but, I don't know how he got it. Horses um, riding by the end. This, I believe, is after they had left the stables. I think it was the trail ride still went down through Woodstock. As I was telling Roy earlier, can you imagine riding a horse through Woodstock today? We used to send, we used to send 10 to 15 horses a day on, on Mount Tom. And they had to go down Court Street, around the Green, across the bridge, which was the Iron Bridge, yeah. down River Street, and up on the, and come back down through. Well, you know, horses don't go too far before they're leaving deposits. Oh, yeah. One deposit today, the EPA, the Environmental Protection, the, the River Resources, and Clean Harbors would have to be on the scene to pick it up. That's the one thing we didn't have to clean up. That's right. We could get them to poop outside the barn. We didn't clean it. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't discuss it. Good idea. We could have used a cork, I suppose. <laughs> there is another picture, which I'm going to get. This is going to get me into trouble, and I probably won't be spoken to tonight. There's another. There's another picture of riders going by here, but it's a straight-on angle from the green, and there's three horse, three horses going by the porch here, and the one in the middle is sitting over there. My better half. My much better half being led by her wicked stepmother. <laughs> um, these are the temporary stalls I talked about. Um, there again, one of the few inside pictures I could get. This was checking in uh, the day before the ride. They had to get all the vital statistics. Uh, at one time they used to weigh them, weigh the horses. That, that kind of petered out. This was the in inside stall. This was first thing in the morning. This is like 6 o'clock in the morning. All these people, including the uh, gentleman here with the Jodfers, or whatever, yeah. Um, there's, whoops, there you go. There's the same picture, but these are these, every day they had to be weighed in because they each class had to have a specific weight minimum, and if you didn't, you had to carry lead. I carried about twenty pounds of lead. <laughs> yeah. The, the the I remember I remember Mr. McCracken's. Mr. McCracken saying he always he always was going to ride heavy weight. He didn't have to worry about the weight. <laughs> he carried his own. <laughs> we had some characters that would come to this stable for the hundred mile. I mean, we had some major characters. This is this was common. People would families would arrive. One one was riding one horse, but everybody else, mother, sister, they would decorate the daylights out of the, out of the stalls, and um, it was a family happening. And, but when, when they left the stables, they went to Green Mountain, that all stopped. Um, yeah. It all stopped. There was total different atmosphere. Um, There's nothing magnificent about the Jay mm -hmm. Brown. I mean, this place was really magical. Wow. This is truly magical. This is true. M magical is a super turn. This picture I like, this, this really shows the interest in Woodstock. This was September 1944. This was just after Normandy, just before the invasion of the Netherlands, both of which our father flew in. Look at the crowd. Where'd they come from? Gas rationing? The, this, the first year of the war, there was discussion about not having it. And, and it was less that, well, 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 we'll have it. We'll run it as small as we have to and people can do the best they can. People rode up from Boston. People rode in from Albany. They came up from Hartford, rode their horses up, did the ride, and rode home. No helmets? Yeah. <laughs> you, anybody know where this is? You do. Rail Field. Yep, right here. My grandmother lived up here. And my, my spent my adulthood in the dealership right over there where that is. Much of my disgust. When do you think um, helmets began to be everywhere? When they had too many lawyers. Nineties? <laughs> I did the hundred mile in seventy four and I didn't I turned nineties off that. 
Probably the eight. Yeah. No, I think the ninety. Because when I came out, I heard there were so many people. This, this is the hunter jumper people were using. The hunter jumper is different. Total, yeah. total different yeah. ball of wax. I mean, they were they were designed to fall off. I I have a tip in my neck. I've been ten months in, in therapy trying to get rid of. I refer to what it comes from my flying lessons. Takeoffs were great. Flight was fabulous. I never hit the ground. It wasn't a crash because I was launched by a horse. And, and I really should have avoided it and just sent it to elbow. But this is Oliver C. Ferguson, who we, anybody that had horses for a long time, probably had him as a farrier. His, he is father to Scott. Anybody know Scott? Okay. Um, and this, this had to be in the 60s because that's a 60, oh, mid 60s scout he was working out of. He was my farrier, and Scott later was my farrier. 100 miles somewhere. This was under the spreading chestnut tree of Village Smithy Stands. Well, that, that, that ain't no chestnut tree. That's an elm tree. That was behind the stables, and that was our blacksmith shop. And this is Oliver again. I'm going to butcher the name, and I apologize. The horse's name was Tangerine. Phyllis Cradrioli out of Windsor Locks, Connecticut, was the writer. That's her dad, Jack. They came up. Two days later, the mayor found it on the road. Brought, they got her home, got her home, got her back here, and for about two weeks she was standing in one of the paddocks. We dug it out, filled it full of moss, and put the water to it, and she stood there with her feet in the water for two weeks. Meantime, he, is, he has his trailer off somewhere, and they made a, a sling so they could get the mare in and sling her up, and he hauled her back to Windsor Walk. She lived to be 33 years old. Phyllis now raises Morgan horses in California. And a friend of Kathy's. This was a newspaper. Um, uh, this is uh, Fergie and Ruth at Christmas time, making the treats for the horses in the barn. This was the upper end. This that set of ears right there would be carrots. Mr. Mr. Pierce's horse, quarter horse, and I don't know if he was there, but that would have been Pride in the next aisle, big high step in Morgan, and across the aisle would have been Red Wing. <laughs> See, remember that, like yesterday. I can close my eyes at any time and visualize that barn. I can walk down at every door, every water faucet, every every everything. Uh, Hoppy probably. We had Hoppy and Star in our day, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, apples look pretty good. They left in 1960. New partnership, Woodstock Inn. Stables. Um, that's when I discovered the Woodstock Inn owned it. <laughs> Never had heard about the Woodstock Inn stables before as a kid. But she came into town, had all the uh, all hopes and dreams and everything of a young lady who was going to be in the horse world and cut a big swath and come to Woodstock and lasted a year. And she, um, at the end of the year, the end of the summer, uh, Ruth got a call from Green Mountain that they needed her to run the last hundred mile out of there. And as I like to say, the stable rats got the call. We came in off the bench. She called us, got us all back to work. And we took care of the hundred mile and we closed up. Shortly after that, Ted Lockett came in from California. Ted had been around here for a number of years. Previously, he'd gone to California. And a bunch of people at Green Mountain Horse Association, Horse Association convinced him that he could come back and run the stables and make a lot of money. Well, <coughs> something happened between him leaving California and arriving in Vermont because it didn't happen. One of the early things was the first sawdust, load of sawdust he had came in, the truck fell through the floor. So they discovered the floor was a little weak. Someone made a decision, presumably the end, certainly wouldn't have been Ted, uh, made a decision to tear the floor out and put dirt down and use it as an arena. Looking back on it, um, probably was a really, 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 really bad thing to do. Because the way the trusses and everything were built, they had to be all integral. 
the floor was holding the walls together. So eventually, things were beginning to move. I, and plus, he went out of business. And I think at that point, the inn used it as a good excuse to, we need, it needs to come down. So they did. They started tearing it, almost the end, and I'm way over my time. And I, I keep looking over here. I'm waiting for the hook to come out and get dragged in behind the curtain. <laughs> um, it was half torn down on April 13, 1963. North half was pretty well gone. South half was, they'd sold everything out of it they could sell. They were way behind. Um, I, was, I happened to be sitting on top of a hood of a tractor up in Tigo, sugaring, when I saw the flames come up. But it, uh, Linda Thompson and Kathy White had a habit of, on um, weekends, of walking through the stables, what was left of it. Saturday afternoon, the workmen had just left, so they beat feet over there, and they're going in the back door. And when they did, there was this pile of, of rubbish, boards, stuff that was on fire very shortly after they had left. I'm a suspicious person. Yeah. Later became more suspicious when I started investigating fires. <laughs> uh, anyways, it didn't make a bit of a difference because the barn was coming down. But that took off. They had to run, Kathy ran all the way to the fire station to turn in the alarm because the box at the corner was disconnected. She ran all the way down, which, you know, my, what, half mile? And the alarm came in, the first Woodstock came on the scene and said, oh, we, we, need, we got a structure fire, give us all the help you can plan. Nineteen minutes from the time they got a call, White River Junction rolled in with a truck and eight men. Eight minutes. Eighteen. Eight minutes. Uh, Eighteen minutes and eight men. They had one hell of a ride on the back of that fire truck. And when they arrived, it was fully involved. And at the time, the Woodstock Inn was hosting the Vermont Loggers Convention. The backyard was full of cranes and loaders and all sorts of heavy equipment. And there had been a car, waitress's car, parked by the back of the stables. And one of the operators looked over and said, whoops, that's not in a good place. So he jumped on his enormous um, forklift that would be in a, in a log, logging yard, went around, picked up the car, <laughs> took it down Court Street and set it by the green. <laughs> um, and then later the cranes came over and was pulling it apart so they could get the fire put out. But um, it, uh, it, it, was, it just went. But, I mean, there was fire brands going everywhere. There was, down on South Street, there was fire. Uh, Roy talks about the Maple Street and stuff. It was just full of smoke. Yeah, debris. Hot as hell, and the wind was blowing. Yeah. So. And the golf course. And the golf course. The the um, uh, little, as you go down South Street, there's a side road that cuts up, that comes in the bottom of, of Linden Hill over there. There were two, three houses there. The roof caught, but they put them out. My neighbors put them out. And everybody, everybody turned out. I mean, it was a, it's like the fire service we used to say. Now there's a fire worth going to. <laughs> Tell me again, what month was it? That was April 13th, 19, uh, 1963. Thirteen. Oh. I remember that because my birthday's on the phone. <laughs> what was April? That's when it burned. You sure it's not We wouldn't put up here on that. No. I know it's April. What's that date? It does say it It says 11, 16. Yeah. And I think I, I no, thought I was away at four. No, that's a I know, I, I know. We no, were away at college because you were in college. That's a four. It's a four. Oh. It looks like 11, but it's a oh, four. Yeah, oh. I, see. I don't I know when that came out of it. This is something. Yeah. I don't remember who gave this to me. Uh, a few years ago, the Green Mountain Horse Association put together a, a video, and part of it was was on the stables, in the 100 mile basically, and on the stables and whatnot. And and the, the editor of the Standard said it was April 28, 1964. He had the right month, wrong year, wrong day. Other than that, he was fine. But, um, uh, I'm missing, what am I missing? Nothing, I guess. Oh yeah, a couple of things. Quickly, briefly. Whoops. And the barn was a witness and stood and saw it all. That one did. It's like being in Las Vegas. It stayed in Las Vegas. Whatever you did at the barn stayed at the barn. Won't go any further than that. 
the souls, the barn bills. There was there was um, an article in uh, Horse of the Chronicle, and it tells about what a barn can do for young people, teach them to work, and one thing or another. And uh, as far as I know, it's still available online, and it, it really is. I just read it today, as a matter of fact, and it really is. That was in the Chronicle of the Horse. Yes. To us, the stable rats, there will never be an ending. The barn may be gone, but it ain't. <laughs> Thank you. And if you have pictures, you've got memories you'd like to share, I'd love to have them. I have some cards here if you'd like to get a hold of me. I'm still looking. I'm about to get started. <laughs> I'm told I'm about to start a book. Now, I would like to also thank the History Center, Green Mountain Horse Association, Bruce Heckney, Hickey, uh, Joan Hudson, Kathy, Jan, myself, and special thanks to Jenny and Matthew. They were spectacular in putting this together. I was having computer problems, and Jenny took right care of them. I haven't shot the computer yet, but it's getting close. And there we go. Any questions? Anybody got any questions? Yes. You, you mentioned in that first one about the two houses. Oh, yes, back, yes. Back to the two it. houses. I'm sorry. Thank you. Right across the road, there was two houses that I said saved the, went through the fire, were fine. They went through the second fire, were fine. Mm -hmm. Now, they have just about worn out their night live. And they're still there? And they're still there, still being used, yes. I can remember the one, because I was on the first fire truck. I met the fireman between the Woodstock Barrage and the, the building, and they threw the, the uh, pump thing, the hose, you know, the big thing on the button. They threw it in, hooked it up, and the fire was just, just consuming the building at that point, and couldn't get the pump to start. And I can remember one of the firemen had an ax in there pulling on the thing to, to move the handle to get the water to the pump to start working. And I remember turning around towards the fire and just feel the heat. Oh, I mean, it's just a blast. And looking down the street, that first house that was actually closest to that part of the barn, the glass windows were melting and running down the side of the building. Oh, my God. They came close to losing that house. But the firemen saved it. They had water on it. First thing. And I can remember a bunch of my friends. We were up on Mount Tom. It was springtime. Yeah. There was still snow there. But we were... I mean, we lived on Mount Tom, all of us around right here, yeah, yeah. and we were up there, and we saw the, saw the smoke, and you know, heard all, you know, we all came running down, and it was, you know, it was amazing. But we could see it from up there, just see the smoke everywhere. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what it was at that point. I was my my, my question was, uh, who paid? For, I assume the Woodstock Inn built it. Who who paid for? The architect and the builder. Woodstock Inn. It, 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 built it. Woodstock Inn. It built it. So, so they were paying rent. Obviously yes, paying yes. rent. There so was a long list of of uh, <coughs> people who leased it slash rented it. Yeah. Um, and they seemed to move around. But the other the other livery stables that are in town seem to be like a domino effect. Because some years you'll find Townsend was here and Townsend was there and Townsend was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But it was um, Fergie was the one that was there for twenty years. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, the stable has been gone two years less than it was built. We all remember it. Mm -hmm. Daryl remembers it. Mm -hmm. I was always impressed going in the tack room with the, with the trophies and the ribbons that just covered the walls and pictures. It was... Uh, um, Furby was top flight gated rider, Medicine Square Garden and all. Ruth was as well. Mm -hmm. Stumbled onto that one day out of the blue. <coughs> and gated horse, and you know, I know some of you may not know what a gated horse yeah. is, but it's, it's yeah. a high stepping yeah. um, yeah. horse. And uh, at one time, Mr. Moon brought him in. Um, there was always an undercurrent that he would bring them to the Morgans. It's where the park horses came from. Because at that point in time, the Morgan horse, uh, the Morgan horse only stud book for registration. Yeah. So there was, and he was quick to jump on. He was quite, he was quite the man. If, if you, I'd like to sometime do a, a, a upway uh, story um, because my mother 
had been her maid next door there, and she knew all the upway people. And my uncle used to work there. Your father used to work there. Um, but he had like 50 employees out there in South Woodford. Yeah, that's right. He retired Donald Smith. Okay, he retired Donald Smith to Mr. Garso. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Mr. Garso. <laughs> yeah. yeah. With his big black boy. With his big black boy. And every once in a while he decided he wanted to take a horse ride. This is her dad had a really, really spectacular trotting horse and wrenched the shoulder and had to be given away. Uh, Mr. Garso had him taken care of him. Every once in a while Mr. Garso decided, I'm going to go for a drive. Well, Donald Smith knew one speed. Yeah, no. race speed, and they would come down through South Woodstock like a shot. <laughs> Ivan Shrove used to say, "What about Castle would by the shop and I ran over up, saddled along hill and back home again, never missing a beat." Thank you. Peter, how are you? Thank you. Very. 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 Very.